Um, first order of business, uh, this is September 21st, 2004 meeting, Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Uh, first order of business is a review of the minutes of the previous meeting of August 17th, 2004. And I had the opportunity to review the minutes. And if so, we can entertain a motion. Yes, Dave. Move that they be accepted as read. Sorry, I have a correction. Actually, two. Sure. Um, yes, on page five, top line, <coughs> Mr. Geraldo contends that the closer the two roads are to each other, the second two should be TO. And on page 12, um, under beyond, therefore, be ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, facts presented, the application of Joseph Rostov should be up for him. Um, under number one, it should say that all of the previous findings and conditions. Thank you, Barbara. Any other changes? We have a motion for the minutes as revised. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay, the minutes are approved. Uh, correspondence tonight letter from Mr. and Mrs. Rand, three Cape Family Medicine Project, email from Jay Seraldo, re Cape Family Medicine, uh, letter from Code Enforcement Officer, re Hamlin Street. Uh, we have a letter from Sharon Mullen Campbell regarding the Murray Private Road review, uh, memorandum from the Conservation Commission regarding Murray Private Road Review. Copy of the deed for 1226 Shore Road in connection with the uh, Cape Family Medicine Project and an email dated September 19th from Timothy Lunny regarding the In by the Sea application. Is that it? Correspondence? Okay, that takes care of the correspondence. First item on the agenda is a consent agenda item. Layton Farm Subdivision Amendment, a request for an amendment to a previously approved Layton Farm Subdivision to revise building envelope for lot two. Um, I would remind the board that on consent agenda items, if anyone on the board wishes to discuss this matter, uh, it, they should then make a request that it be placed on the regular agenda. And absent that, we can uh, vote on the consent agenda item. Is there anyone that would like to engage in any substantive discussion on this? Okay, so I'll entertain a motion then. Yes. Motion for the board to consider the in order that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Wiley Enterprises LLC to amend the subdivision approval for the latent parts subdivision to expand the building envelope for lot to be approved. Motion's been made. Do we have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Second. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Under old business, first item is the Murray Private Road Review. It's a request for review of a private road under the subdivision ordinance and resource protection permit to create frontage for two lots located off Fowler Road. Uh, 
What we would like to do is hear briefly from the applicant regarding the status of the application and then we will open a public hearing. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. I request the opportunity to recuse myself. I have a little bit of involvement with this. All right. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Good evening. Good evening. My name is John Mitchell of Mitchell and Associates, and I represent Steve Murray, who is here this evening. Uh, the property is located on the northerly side of Fowl Road, in between Hampton Road and Jewett Road, uh, and it consists of two parcels. Parcel A, uh, which is 2.8 acres, located here, and Parcel B, which is uh, consisting of 1.8 acres. Uh, it is pretty much surrounded by uh, single-family residential use uh, other than the northerly portion of the property which is owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. The proposal uh, consists of the development of a private road extending from Fowler Road um, down along uh, the property line, hugging the property line, and then terminating with a uh, hammerhead turnaround, which has been designed in accordance with the town standards. We're recommending um, an 18 foot wide paved road section for the first 160 feet, which will be curved on either side, uh, and then transitioning into a 14 foot wide gravel road uh, with two foot wide uh, grass shoulders on either side um, and then uh, as I mentioned it would terminate with the hammerhead turnaround. Uh, the <coughs> building envelope for parcel A has been shown um, in this corner of the property adhering to the 30 foot setbacks on three sides and a 250 foot setback uh, from the RP1 wetlands. We had the wetlands as I presented at the last meeting uh, Dale Brewer delineated the wetlands and identified uh, or most of them are RP2 wetlands in the low portion of the property. Uh, everything draining down into the northwesterly corner of the property where there's an RP1 wetland. And from there uh, we have established the 250 foot setback. Uh, the private road will serve two purposes. It will provide access to parcel A and it will provide frontages uh, for parcel A and parcel B. Uh, parcel A does not have any frontage on a public or private road currently um, and the only frontage for parcel B is this 26 foot wide strip of land. The road is uh, 660 feet uh, in length total and uh, uh, we have we have a, uh, addressed all of Steve Harding's comments uh, I think he had three final comments uh, which are in your packet and uh, Public Works is recommending uh, a couple catch basins at the intersection of our road and follow road. Um, we don't necessarily agree with that recommendation. However, we are showing one catch basin on the easterly side of the road. Um, and the reason not for, for showing not for showing a second catch basin is that it would interfere with a very large uh, 46 inch oak tree which is located right on the property line. Uh, if we were to install that catch basin, the, the pipe would definitely get into the root system of that oak tree. Um, <coughs> Steve has spoken with each of the abutters. <coughs> um, uh, Sharon Mullen, uh, I believe, has written a letter to the planning board uh, indicating her uh, concern about buffering and she's asked for the lilacs which are currently located on Steve's property to
to be transplanted in the in uh, in the same location uh, just off of our road, which we will agree to do, uh, and we will also plant an additional row of lilacs um, in this in between the house and the roadway. Uh, the second of butter, Mr. Matusko. Uh, has, I believe, called uh, Marine and indicated or stated his that he doesn't really have any concerns about buffering. And um, we have indicated in our application a number of waivers that we're requesting. And I don't know if the board wants me to go over those or not. Well, why don't we? we, we they are. We have gone through those, I know, prior, and I'm sure we can go through them after, but maybe we'll have the public hearing okay. first, and then we can address that, if that's OK. Very good. Yep. Thank you. Uh, all right, there has been a public hearing scheduled on this application. I'd like to open the public hearing. Anyone that wishes to speak, please approach the podium and identify themselves and say where they live, and we'd be happy to listen to you. Anyone here on the private access way for Murray? No. Okay. And we will close the public hearing. And we can talk about waivers sooner than we thought. Yes, there are a number of waivers requested. Mr. Mitchell, maybe you can just go quickly okay. summarize those. Uh, the first one has to do with the radi radii on the, where the private drive intersects Fowler Road. The ordinance calls for a 25 foot wide radius and we're proposing a uh, four foot radius and that is, we're constrained by the width of this, um, the 26 foot width. Um, and that is the largest radius that we could fit um, on the 18 foot wide roadway. So that's number one. Uh, number two is the road width itself. The ordinance calls for a 22 foot wide uh, width for the roadway for a private road. And we're proposing, as I said, an 18 foot wide here, transitioning into a 14 foot wide uh, gravel drive. <coughs> and basically, um, it will, this is only going to serve one residence which is located on Pasale. So we really didn't see the need, nor did the fire chief uh, see the need for a wider road than that. The shoulder width, uh, as I mentioned, we're proposing a two foot wide grass shoulder on either side of the roadway. The ordinance calls for a four foot wide shoulder. The center line road radius, there's uh, one radius located right here the ordinance calls for a 125 foot center line radius um, and we are proposing a 40 foot radius which is basically all we can fit in this this corner of the property um, and again we've we've reviewed this with the fire chief and the fire chief has has approved um, this radius as well as the road width uh, the fifth waiver is the right-of-way width. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's a 26-foot uh, strip of land here, so we would need a, a waiver on that. The ordinance calls for a 50-foot radius. We are proposing a 50-foot radius for the, the remainder of the roadway from this point to the end. And then the last waiver is the 8-inch water main. The ordinance for a private road requires an 8-inch water main. Uh, we're only serving one residence. Um, we don't need a hydrant. Therefore, um, it's not necessary to have an 8-inch main. Will that only serve one residence for now or forever? This will only serve one residence. I mean, this, this road cannot be extended. Um, and the water main as well? in the water main cannot, uh -huh. right? <clears throat> um, now, that, that's, when I say one radius, uh, one residence, that's 
and maybe Steve can speak to this, but that's not to say that a structure may not be built on this, on this uh, possible beat. The only thing I may do with that possible would be build a garage. No house. <clears throat> John, what's the length of the one foot, a uh, one inch water main supposed to be? Total length. What is the length? John, don't we have a two inch main? Yeah, we have, we have, we're proposing a two inch service. Okay. So it says one inch. Yeah, it says one inch, I know. The plans uh, indicate two inch. I that think we had point. one inch in the, in the initial um, application, and we've changed it to two inch. And what is the length of it? I guess my real concern is whether the fire chief has reviewed that, whether there's enough water pressure at the end of that to satisfy any pumper needs. Case of fire. Well, no, no. The, if if the fire if the fire department needed water for this residence here, they would take it off of this hydrant. Okay, they can which get is off. fed by an eight inch. Okay. Yep. The one, the two inch is just for the domestic for the house. Questions, Barbara. <clears throat> this is a question for Maureen. Maureen, <clears throat> in the last. Uh, the subdivision, the Hamilton Street subdivision, we had the RP1 wetland attached to the RP2. And if it was a certain size, we had a, you had to be 100 feet from the building envelope. Does that apply here, or is this less than an acre? It, it applies here to the RP1 wetlands. And John, if you could just point to the RP1 wetlands. Um, those are in that area, and a 250-foot buffer has been applied to this. That's why the building envelope for the lot I is understand shoved the all part, the way over. But the part of the, the RP2 the RP, wetlands. Right. The RP2 wetlands do not have a mandatory buffer around them. They are a buffer that can be established by the planning board. They don't have the same requirement for 250 or 100-foot buffer. In the Hamlin Street subdivision, we were struggling with the buffer for an RP1 wetland. Okay, whether the RP2 actually enlarged the RP2. The RP2 can't, yeah, the RP2 doesn't, you have to have at least an acre of RP1 all on its own. And we don't, unlike some of the DEP regulations, we, we don't, any, any size RP2 wetland we regulate and we protect. An undersized RP1 <coughs> wetland, that would be a wetland that's less than an acre in size, would automatically be thrown into the RP2 wetland category. So we protect wetlands of all sizes. It's just to be to get that heavy-duty restrictive RP1 protection, you need to have at least an acre. We don't combine the two. Okay. I'll talk about the other one so I understand it better a little another time. Um, while we're on wetlands, John, um, if let's see. Have you applied to the DEP for a yes. permit? Okay. Yes, we have, and we've submitted a copy to the town. Oh, so you've already gotten a permit? The no, we, we submitted a copy of the application to the town. Thank you. Yes. Other questions? Yes, Dave. John, based on your presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it appears that the, the primary area of disagreement that you have with the town engineer's letter is the one catch basin versus two. Is there any information that you could give us tonight that would support, help us support the finding that one catch basin would be adequate to deal with any of the, the runoff issues? Yeah. Um, we, well, we, my disagreement is with the catch basins at all. I, I don't believe there's a need for the catch basins. Uh, Bob feels that there's going to be some puddling at the entrance to our drive. Um, I believe that the, the low point of this road is, is in this area, it's not, not at our drive, but we, we're, we're, we're going to build the catch base anyways. But my, my, uh, what I would like to do is to build one catch basin on the easterly side of our entrance, opposite the side that has the 46 inch oak, and we're going to pitch the width of the road towards that catch basin. It's not going to be crowned. It will be cross sloped. So that, and keeping in mind that the high point of our road is only 15 feet off of the follow road. Everything else slopes in this direction here. Mm -hmm. So we're only capturing 15 feet of our, of our roadway. And that, 
and that will pitch towards the catch basin. Based on what you've said, I would be inclined to approve the plans with just the one catch basin. Yeah. I don't know how the other members of the board feel, but that would mean we'd have to just slightly revise uh, one of the conditions in the draft uh, motion. That I think uh, one of the conditions is that your plans be revised to reflect the comments of the town engineer. Uh, it seems to me we could say with the exception of the comments related to the catch basins. And, and my understanding is your plans already reflect the one catch basin. Correct? Yep. But not the plans you have. Not the plans no. you have. We've revised the plan. All right. Bob Malley has a copy of it. Has, uh, has Bob commented on your proposal to put one catch basin pitched, the road pitched towards it? I don't know if he's called Marine or not. I, I haven't heard from him. Yeah, he, I haven't heard from him either. It was submitted yesterday. So. <clears throat> Other questions? Uh, absent any other questions, would somebody like to make a motion? Yes, Barbara. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. One, Stephen Murray is proposing to construct a private road which will also require a resource protection permit in order to create road frontage for two lots located off Fowler Road, U20-11-1-6, and which needs review under section 16-3-2, road design and construction standards, and section 19-8-3, resource protection permit. Two, the proposed private road will require several waivers from the local road standards which are detailed in the application and shown on the plans. The planning board finds that the requested waivers will not create a more hazardous traffic condition, will provide more imaginative design, will secure substantially the same standards of road design, and will not have the effect of nullifying the objectives of this ordinance and the comprehensive plan. Three, the town engineer and public works director are recommending the installation of catch basins to avoid a potentially hazardous ponding situation on Fowler Road. Uh, four, the private road will extend between two existing homes that will benefit from buffering. And five, the application substantially complies with section 16-3-2 road design and construction standards and section 19-8-3 resource protection permit. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Stephen Murray to construct a private road, which will also require a resource protection permit in order to create frontage for two lots located off Fowler Road, be approved and subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated 9-14-04, with the exception that one catch basin will be installed on the easterly side of the intersection of Fowler Road and Brothers Way. Two, that the plans be revised to show the existing lilac bushes located south of the roadway will be relocated and that an additional five lilac bushes will be planted to create a buffer between the road and the Campbell Mullen lot. Three, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the above conditions have been met. Thank you, Barbara. Been moved, do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. That's approved. Thank you.
Next item on the agenda is the uh, Cape Elizabeth Family Medicine Office Edition. Uh, this is also scheduled for. Is it scheduled for public hearing? Yes, it's also scheduled for a public hearing. So we would ask the applicant to briefly summarize where we are in the project. Then we'll open the public hearing, and then we can uh, discuss the application in more detail. Good evening. Uh, I'm Mark Wilcox, uh, here tonight representing Dr. Johnson since he was unable to make uh, the meeting. Uh, however, we have gone over in detail uh, the state of the application. And at this point in time, I guess the best thing for me to do would be to update you on a couple of things that uh, have transpired uh, since, the, since last month. Uh, the first thing, uh, and, and most notably, uh, is the, the intention on the part of the applicant to begin uh, landscaping uh, was held up uh, due to a determination by the code officer uh, that this would be a further uh, violation of the old site plan approval. Uh, we have had a site walk, had had the site walk and mapped out where the buildings are and the other change uh, since then uh, involves uh, a plan on the part of the applicant to not build the entire parcel out at once. And what his intention would be, would be to do the addition to the main building in the fall and delay doing the addition, the uh, garage and storage building until next spring at the earliest. And we can talk about it uh, in more detail, but I've represented that on this sketch plan, uh, basically dividing the site in half. Uh, otherwise, there have been no changes to the plans, uh, and I'd be interested in your comments. Okay. Um, I guess we'll, we'll open the public hearing and uh, would ask that anyone that wishes to speak, please approach the lectern and identify themselves. Uh, also give your address, and we'd be happy to listen to your comments. So, public comment. I'm Alice Brand at 1222 Shore Road, and my husband Peter and I have been a Butters at 12. To, uh, 1226 Shore Road for over 42 years and we were very pleased when we heard that the town had sold to a physician and looked forward to maintaining a good neighbor relationship. We were surprised however when without any discussion with us our buffer evaporated one summer day. In talking with Dr. Johnson, subsequent to that, we both agreed that neither of us wanted to look more closely at each other. And <clears throat> historically speaking, I served on a revision for both the subdivision ordinance and Zork, a zoning ordinance rewrite commission or committee. And the issue of buffers was thoroughly uh, aired, and particularly the maintenance of a buffer in which a residential zone butts up against a commercial zone. Therefore, both my husband and I feel it is reasonable to ask that a proper buffer be reestablished, along with a request for a performance guarantee for maintenance before construction starts to protect our privacy and minimize noise. We do appreciate all your uh, deliberations on this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on the uh, 
application of Cape Elizabeth Family Medical Office. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and back to Mr. Wilcox. Questions, Barbara? Or who's Dave? Uh, Mr. Wilcox, I am very concerned about the, the, concern, uh, the issues raised by the abutter, both in writing and here tonight. And I'm wondering, uh, and I'd be inclined to uh, condition any building that goes on the property uh, on the completion or the, uh, the rectification of the buffer pursuant to the plans that you've proposed. I'm wondering if the applicant is agreeable to that. Uh, the applicant has uh, made arrangements uh, with a tree maintenance company from Portland by the name of Arbor Care uh, to come in uh, subsequent uh, to this meeting and, and proceed with the planting of the buffer uh, trees and uh, landscaping uh, in the, I guess, phase one, the main building area as we've marked it here. Uh, and arrangements uh, have been made for that. And uh, furthermore, uh, in terms of the uh, survivability of the plant material, uh, Arbor Care has uh, given Dr. Johnson a one-year warranty that everything uh, that they plant uh, at this time in the fall uh, will, will either survive uh, or be replaced. The, uh, the buffer that would then be put in for phase two, which are those the trees that are in yellow? Yes. Do they, do they help buffer the Rand's home, though, from the construction that will be going on for the addition? I, just, I, mean, I, don't, I don't see in the plans where their home falls uh, uh, next okay, door. I'm just wondering if, that, if, if, if it's okay to just say, we're only going to do half the buffer now and wait until next spring to do the other half. In, in, looking, in looking at that, uh, our inclination is that the, uh, the disturbance of removing the hemlocks and uh, doing the grading and adding these trees, uh, if the garage was not being built, uh, would be more of a disruption and more of an intrusion. Uh, than if it was just saved until the, the trigger, if you will, of building the garage uh, came along and happened. Uh, the only reason that there is more paving being added and, and consequently more fill to keep the paving flush with the existing parking lot is that the garage doors knock out four parking spaces. And the parking spaces are necessary uh, to support the area of the main building. Uh, in terms of the Rand's property, uh, yes, there, there, there is a presence there. Uh, their house is right here. Uh, the, the, you don't see the driveway on our plans because it comes around on the other side of the house uh, to this structure right here, which is their garage. Uh, there's a yard in between the two. Uh, but there is also a large clearing. There is a clearing in the woods uh, back here, which is a large, uh, large grassy lawn area, uh, also, uh, which would be, uh, you know, if, if this area uh, were worked on, you you would have an impact there from the yard. Barbara. Mark, could you give us a, a description of what your what the plans are for the landscaping, how many trees, what kind of trees, their height. Um, other plans you have, you've mentioned a berm, <coughs> how high the berm will be, so we can all get a sense of what kind of buffering it will yes. provide. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, in the area immediately, well, not immediately adjacent, but in the, in the area Could of Could you Dr. speak up a little in, bit? In the too. area of Dr. Johnson's uh, lot, that corresponds uh, to the west side of the Rand's house, there would be a, a, a two to two and a half foot high berm uh, constructed. And 
that would be this, this, this shape on the, on the grading plan right here. Uh, and that would be planted with evergreen trees. Uh, in addition to that, there would be evergreen trees would, would fill in this existing uh, oak, sort of uh, cluster of oak trees here. Uh, and in terms of, of the trees that would be planted in this first phase, there would be eight Canadian hemlocks, uh, one Austrian pine, three Colorado green spruce, and uh, five viburnums, just to give a little bit of variety. Uh, they're a deciduous shrub that, that grow to a significant size when they're mature, uh, but they'd help sort of break things up. And what we would be looking at doing in, in addition to that in the immediate fall uh, would be to come back in the spring uh, and the two uh, birches that are indicated for the area right up near the road, which really aren't uh, sort of in the immediate buffer area, would be done in the spring. Uh, just to give them a little bit better, better shot, uh, being deciduous trees and looking for a, an early spring planting. And two other questions: What are uh, the approximate heights of these trees that will go in? And as well, there was a, a note from uh, Steve Harding about the the use of Canadian hemlock. Yes. And and the fact that they're difficult to get and they might be susceptible to insect. Uh, insects, could you speak to that a little bit? Because you did mention Canadian Yes, hemlock, didn't you? Uh, the, uh, the balsam firs have been scheduled to be uh, five to six feet high, uh, the spruces six to seven feet high, the Austrian pine six to seven feet high. Uh, the Canadian hemlocks, the, the last of the, of the group, are uh, to be five to six feet high, and I haven't uh, found out the source that the uh, landscape that Arbor Care is planning to use. However, I did call O'Donnell's yesterday, and they have uh, a large number of hemlocks, uh, which when they were graded last spring were four to five feet high, and they're relatively sure that there are plenty of them that are now, you know, five feet or more in height. Uh, the difficulty in getting getting the trees has has had to do with the certification process that's necessary to to import them. A lot of them come from Canada, and the uh, the certification process has sort of uh, sort of screened out some of the suppliers that aren't aren't as able to to deal with that. In in terms of the uh, Susceptibility, yes, it's something to be watching, watching out for, uh, but it is, uh, it is a problem which we are uh, a little bit outside of the, the sort of zone which has been recognized as a problem. I think forestry officials are, are fearful that it travels further north, but, but as, as of yet, it's something that, you just, that everybody is just looking out for. Uh, so as long as the material that comes in is certified, there, there should be no problem getting a healthy healthy specimen that, that can be planted. Mark, have you uh, reviewed the buffering plan with uh, RANDS? Uh, no, I have not. <clears throat> we, we were hoping to get, to get together as construction started and sort of uh, have an on-site layout of the buffer, but that was uh, forestalled. Uh, by the order from the town. Now, since they are the aggrieved parties in this, based on the initial violation of the first approval, um, I would really like to see them review that and comment on it before we take any action. That's my feeling. I um, hope they would have a chance to review it before we make a decision on it. I, I would be happy to yield the microphone. Uh, I beg pardon? I would be happy to give up the microphone if they would like to <clears throat> speak with you. Uh, the, the plans have been, haven't been changed and they have received copies of them. Uh, we haven't heard back that it's an inappropriate response uh, to the situation. Uh, we're uh, more than happy to take, take uh, you know, to 
to view this as a working document and adapt it also. It's not, the, the intention is not to, to do something arbitrary. Oh, I, I understand that. I appreciate that. I wonder if it might be even appropriate to have a five-minute recess so they can privately review plans and privately ask Mark any questions they might have about the plans before we proceed. Okay. Uh, my only concern with that is, at least my understanding is, these plans have been available uh, in the planning department office. Uh, at, at least these look similar to the ones we saw at the site walk. I think they're probably identical to what we saw at the site walk, so I assume these have been available for several days. So it seems to me if Nabutter wanted to have an opportunity to review them, that opportunity was there. But if I'm wrong about that, correct me. Uh, all, all of the people who wrote a letter at the first app application review uh, received this landscaping plan in return. Uh, landscaping is kind of a funny thing, though. It's, you know, there's not polar coordinates on, on each tree. Uh, it's not GIS located. Uh, you know, they can be adjusted a little bit in the field for maximum <coughs> uh, sort of effect. And uh, you know, it's, uh, if it's better to put ones that grow a little bit differently in a slightly different area. But I think the concept of the, the berm, we thought, uh, given the uh, language in the ordinance, the description in the ordinance, the diagram in the ordinance of berms with combined uh, evergreen and, and deciduous uh, plantings being effective buffers is, is really meant to address uh, any, any of your concerns and we can certainly adapt uh, the exact arrangement on the land uh, to the neighbors. Just as a follow-up, my understanding of the RAND's concerns uh, were that they related more to the timing of when the planting was done and that there be a performance guarantee to ensure that if any plantings did not survive the year that they, there would be adequate funds to replace them. So I, I don't know, I just don't think it's necessary to return for more commentary. I, I'd like to ask about that, the timing issue, um, Mark. The, how is what you're proposing, how does it differ from the idea of having the buffering planted, putting forth the performance guarantee prior to construction? How does this phasing address those concerns? Uh, the, the phasing is such that uh, given an approval this evening, the uh, Arbor Care has uh, offered a warranty to stand behind the material because the, the plan would be to put those in first. They're to the Rand's side of the silt fence along the property line. They're in sort of a not, no disturb, no cut, no fill area um, after the berm is built at least. Uh, so the, the intent of, and, and what they've uh, offered as a, as a warranty uh, is that uh, we, we go forward and do them now much, much as we had hoped to last month uh, and it's still early enough in the fall uh, that they will uh, replace any plants that die uh, over the winter or, or up through, through next fall. Uh, and Dr. Johnson uh, does not wish to enter into a performance bond or a performance guarantee. Uh, he feels that he is buying one performance guarantee already uh, from the landscaping contractor who is willing to replace anything that dies and will uh, certainly follow through with that. Okay. My only concern about that approach is I don't know anything about the landscaping company that he's hired, but that, that guarantee or that warranty is only as good as the viability of that business. And if that business were to become defunct and plantings die within the year period, then we're uh, left without a, a, a provision for the replacement of those plantings. So I would still be in favor of a performance guarantee. And I read the draft memo that we received on that issue and I would actually, I don't know if it's appropriate Maureen to actually specify a dollar amount 
if we have authority to do that, but it seems to me the performance guarantee ought to be somehow commensurate with the cost of the plantings, whether it be 25 percent or 50 percent. I'm concerned that if the town manager were to not like this approach, and I have no idea whether he would or he wouldn't, uh, he could easily uh, find a performance guarantee of a very nominal amount acceptable, and I think that would uh, not take care of the problem that we're trying to address. Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, in the draft motion, the motion is very typical of what we usually write for performance guarantee. Um, when I and, and maybe it needs to do more to address what you're asking for, but in the motion where I say state that the applicant shall post a performance guarantee for the landscaping, my intent there was to state that it had to cover all of the landscaping. Usually what we do is we ask the applicant to come up with a unit cost and quantity list um, and then we send that to the town engineer because that's his thing. And he reviews it, will revise it upward as appropriate. Uh, and then we send to the town attorney the actual text of the letter of credit because that's his expertise. And then the whole package the manager likes to have the opportunity to have final say on. Uh, but if the board is concerned that condition two doesn't most, more specifically enough explicitly state that the performance guarantee amount shall cover all of the landscaping, then certainly you could revise this motion. I, I, it would be very difficult to pick an amount out of thin air, so perhaps if we did revise it to indicate that it must cover the, the cost of the landscaping, that, that, then I would find this uh, to take care of our concerns. Gets us off the hook for trying to come up with a number tonight. Right. Yeah. The landscaping per the plan, meaning unit cost, the, the units are right here. So it's just a question of getting cost figures, it seems to me, with that kind of motion. Well, yeah, I, I don't think a specific figure is really in order. I think the intent of it should be there, and that, that will cover it. Um, I had another question, though. The, if, if there is an approval uh, with the requirement that building couldn't be commenced until the landscaping was, was finished, how does that affect the timing that you've already proposed? It sounds like you're going to be waiting on the garage section until the spring uh, anyway. Well, the, the timing that looks like would happen under that scenario uh, would be that uh, by waiting for uh, all of the uh, letters to be cleared through various parties, uh, we will, and working with town attorney and town staff uh, in, a, in establishing uh, what the form and type of a performance guarantee would be, uh, that we will lose the uh, window of opportunity that we have with the landscaping contractor who would then uh, basically a month from now not warranty the plants. Uh, with the plants not warranted uh, to the owner, the owner would probably be hesitant to start the project. Why? Well, I guess I'm missing something. Why would you have to wait to start the landscaping work while the performance guarantee was being put in place? If it's a, if it's a requirement, couldn't that work be commenced before the guarantee is actually in place? Usually we don't allow an applicant to begin any part of the project until all the planning board conditions have been met. Um, when but we they, have well, if, if you wanted to make that exception, you could. Uh, the problem is how do you, I mean, I guess you could condition the performance guarantee that had to be provided prior to the issuance of a building permit for the addition. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking. Um, that's what I was getting at in terms of the timing, so that the landscaping can move on according to schedule. Performance guarantee hopefully would be addressed quickly, but one wouldn't delay the other, theoretically. And if it, if it was a condition of the building permit, then one would assume that would be well in time for that to begin. Uh, you would, however, be asking the applicant to commit the resources to do the construction of the buffer without knowing 
what the percentages are of replacement or, or what the actual result of the condition would be. Well, and I guess if the applicant wanted to be sure, he, he could wait. But that, from what you're telling me, has other disadvantages to the applicant. So, uh, I mean, the, I th you probably have the best idea as to what the landscaping is going to cost. We don't. So I'm sure you already have an idea what it is anyway. I, I, I know what I would suggest. You, you, obviously, not all the trees are going to die. Right. Uh, not even half of them, but, you know, 10% wouldn't be unusual, 15 to 25, but, right. you know, I'm, I'm, that's the sort of range that, that this will, you know, that you would be looking at. Uh, Dr. Johnson has, has indicated that he finds that onerous, uh, but it's up to you to decide whether that's something you want to impose on him. Mm -hmm. Barbara. It seems to me that we need to be reasonable also in terms of a performance guarantee and not ask for um, a performance guarantee to cover every single thing that's put in. I mean, we need to be fair to the applicant too. And I think that Dave mentioned 25 to 50 percent. Um, that's, that's I, I'm not familiar yeah. with this, but, but it seems to me that it's more reasonable to ask for something. And Maureen, didn't you say something about a letter of credit? that could cover this in terms of a performance guarantee as opposed to? Oh, yeah. There's, there's two different options to place a performance guarantee. One is a letter of credit. One is an escrow account. And it's up to the applicant to choose which one they want to go with. Uh, we, all we do is we have requirements. We have forms so that we can hand them out to the applicant <coughs> in a way that says this is the, the, the agreement that has to go along with either the escrow account or the letter of credit. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty routine process if, if you want to move through it quickly. Well, I, I think that a letter of credit isn't going to take any money out of his pocket at all unless something happens. And I think we need to be rational about how much we ask for in terms of a, a percentage and not ask for 100 percent, but rather ask for something. And I'll, I'll defer to the attorneys on this board to say what is usual, standard, and customary. Well, it's not a legal determination as much as how many trees we think are going to not make it, <laughs> frankly. Well, uh, probably not all of them are going to make right. it. Right. I, I agree with that. Uh, I guess I would, I would leave the, I think, unless I'm wrong, Maureen, that if we, if we require a performance guarantee, the applicant has the ability to choose which route they go to fulfill that, is that not right? They, they get to choose which mechanism. Right. However, unless it's specified specifically, the town's policy is that it's 100 percent. Well, I understand the policy and I understand why they would have that policy with certain types of projects. Um, I'd have to agree with Barbara that since the, since the intent of it is to protect vegetation that, that may die so that it can be replaced, uh, I guess I'd be inclined to, to require a percentage. With the understanding, obviously, that if, if it all dies, it all has to be replaced anyway. That, that, um, it's just that we wouldn't have the money there ahead of time, but obviously it doesn't let the applicant off the hook to, to replace you know all of it. I, I find it hard to believe if everything died, and if it did, we'd probably have more to worry about than just that buffer, we think. <laughs> so um, I, I, I tend to agree with Barbara that I think a percentage, um, you know, I, I'd say 30 percent would be, would be fine, and that's probably high. And again, all it means is that money's there up front. doesn't mean that you only have to replace 30 percent of what dies. That's Sure, that's the applicant's understanding as well. The, the point is... I'm not a lawyer. If well, 30% of all the plantings and there are 12 trees, I would assume that that means right off the bat that the performance guarantee would cover four of the trees. Correct. Not, but if all 12 not, trees not, died, the applicant's still required to replace all 12. That's yes. my point. Yeah. Right. And, that, and that's the primary uh, sequence. Is right. The performance guarantee is only if, you know, whatever percent die and they're not replaced, then the town stops. And I mean, we should be looking to the applicant to fulfill his obligations under the approval in the first. It's, it's only 
when all else fails, you have the guarantee there to fall back on. So right. I, I think John's approach is clearly the, the right way to look at it. And, and, I, and I do want to say, for the record, that, that back when, whenever our first or last meeting was, I can't remember which, the applicant was willing and ready to begin the uh, buffering process. And, and it has been delayed due to an interpretation of the, uh, uh, the building code. And there are certainly reasons for that and reasons maybe why it shouldn't have been. But I don't think the applicant can be blamed for wanting to delay where it actually is in their interest to have started that sooner. So um, hopefully now, if we can not create any further reasons for delay and, and not use the performance guarantee to delay the plannings, but rather to just ensure that they're replaced if there's a problem, then I think we can get started doing what we all wanted to do um, a while ago. Uh, I just, just so, had another just question. So that, oh, sorry. So I'm, I'm clear. Can just make sure I have the understanding on this. It's, it's OK to go construct the berm and plant the trees while the performance guarantee is in progress but hasn't been signed and delivered to the town. We haven't got that far. We, we haven't gotten that far yet, but uh, we I can't. Think, uh, that's why I was hearing. The, the practice normally is that cannot occur until after the performance guarantee is in place. We do have the ability, however, to change that condition and allow the work to begin. And my, my suggestion was that the building permit wouldn't be issued until the performance guarantee was in place. That's just a suggestion, but no, I think that's an appropriate. It allows the landscaping to be done. John, Dave, I just sorry. just to continue this one bit further, it, what John Geraldo proposed, Mark, is that in keeping with what your client is looking for? Would he be satisfied with that arrangement? Uh, he's indicated that he wouldn't be satisfied with it. Uh, but, but as I said, it's, uh, there's, there's obviously uh, concerns all the way around on, on this. And uh, he, he feels that since he's getting a warranty from the people who are doing the work, which he in essence has to pay for uh, through, doing, through hiring them, uh, that uh, this amounts to double, double warrantying. That's, you know, but obviously we can't guarantee Arbor Care's a continued existence into next next year. Um, I, I had a question on something else. Uh, the erosion control plan. What, where does that stand? Uh, well, since one wasn't asked for by the town engineer, we don't have one for you yet. Uh, however, if you wish to prepare, have us prepare an erosion control plan. Uh, one could be provided. Uh, basically, we have already shown uh, silt fencing and erosion control measures on the on the uh, plan that was submitted. Uh, that might be why one wasn't asked for. Uh, but through as we start the landscaping process, uh, we would be able to determine you know, things like how much loam would be stripped and where vehicles would need to go and whether or not there would need to be wintering over of, of loam for next next year, those, those sorts of things. And so we, we could put together something that would, would sort of serve as a, as sort of a, uh, a game plan, if you will, for the earthwork activities on the site. Yes. Maureen, yeah. if we were to make preparation of an erosion control plan, a condition of this approval, would we want to say that it has to be in a form or it has to be acceptable to the, to the town engineer? What would be the, the kind of check and check there? I want to apologize to the applicant if it's on the plans, but when I reviewed them before, I couldn't find it. Um, the, you... the silt fence is just a line that sort of goes the whole length of the... And it, it's on which sheet? Uh, well, I 
Curiously uh, enough, it's, uh, it is shown on drawing on the grading plan because it sort of corresponds to the areas where there is grading being done. Uh, it's in the legend on the layout and plantings plan. However, it doesn't show there at all. Uh, it shows on uh, drawing L2 uh, pretty much uh, bounding uh, the areas wherever there would be any, any cuts or fills or grading. Uh, the site is uh, a relatively uh, low slope site and uh, you know we haven't had a civil engineer for this project but uh, we'd certainly be able to put together something that would sort of show you uh, where the earthwork operations would be on the site. In my opinion the board has some flexibility on an erosion control plan and even the most minimal effort would be considered an erosion control plan. There is a line on the plan that shows silt fencing and it's around the area of construction so I would say that the option has met that. There's, there's also a detail in, for how the silt fencing would be, would be sort of towed into the ground and that sort of thing. Other questions? I'd like to come back to my concern. I hope the purpose of the buffering here is really correct problem, and I would really like to hear from either Dr. Rand or Mrs. Rand, based on what they know, whether they find the buffering to be adequate. Well, we, we've had a public hearing. Um, the plans were available and out there, and I assume that if whoever came to the public hearing and viewed the plans, if they had a concern, they would have, they would have expressed it. Uh, Maureen? For the record, Dr. and Mrs. Rand did meet with me and we did go over the plans and we discussed the types of plants that were proposed and uh, I did suggest that they want to look at the plantings to see if they wanted to suggest anything and I have to assume that since they're looking at implementation rather than amplification, that the proposed buffer is satisfactory, although they, they were clear that they preferred the original landscape. <laughs> yes, Barbara, sorry. Well, one more thing that's, um, the town engineer made a comment about the cleaning up the ends of the, I'm missing my paper. The ends of the pipe in the back, the silt, and when, when we went on the site walk, we discussed that the, the applicant um, said that that was exactly the way it was when he received the property and the town hadn't done anything to clean up the ends of the pipe. And the, I think we all agreed, those of us who were there, that it wasn't fair to ask the applicant to clean the ends of that now and maybe disturb that area. It may create more problems than it would solve. And that's a note in the engine, town engineer's letter. It's number, um, number three. Number three. I think Maureen can speak to that. The applicant uh, provided me a copy of the deed to the property. The property was sold to the applicant by the town. And that's the copy you have in front of you tonight. Um, the last page under item three states that the town of Cape Elizabeth shall maintain, repair, and replace such drainage pipes and catch basins from time to time. I just want to be sure that, so there are any problems with this, that, the, that we discussed that at the site walk, and I, I think we all agreed, and now it's clear in the deed. So that should be accepted from the town engineer's letter. 
And, and in talking with Dr. Johnson and, and going over uh, this issue, he, he indicated that there is uh, certainly the opportunity when he goes forward with the garage, uh, since there will be a moderate amount of clearing in the same area, that he'd be more than able to coordinate with the town uh, to bring whatever equipment in through the uh, disturbed area, rather than punching in and coming in with a piece of machinery from from the main town road uh, and just sort of you know, attack it from back at the back of the garage where it would be you know, fairly easy to get at the, those pipes from back there. And if but at least I wishes, personally don't think it should be part of this process and that we should accept that number yeah. from the letter. Whatever he wants to do with the town is his business and has nothing to do with this application. Right. Dave? Is that comment number three in the town engineer? Yes. Okay. I have a motion. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. One, Dr. Craig Johnson is proposing to construct a 1,000 